Hey, Harold Hornet. I hope you've had a great week. I know I have having vacation and being able to spend some time with family and enjoying my summer. Um, we've got the 4th of July coming up, so that's more time that we get to spend with family, and that's always important. I hope you've been reading. I hope you've gone to the library and tried to find some books that you're interested in. Today, we're going to um, read a couple more chapters of the book Out of My Mind by Sharon Draper. I haven't said that before, but it is by Sharon Draper. Um, I am going to try to get on a little bit more often because as you can see, it's kind of a thick book and we want to make sure that we're getting through this this summer. And because with chapter books, it is kind of hard to remember what's happening um, if we take too long in between. So just as a refresher, the first four chapters were kind of talking from birth on with Melody. Now remember, we left off with Melody having gone to a special doctor who basically accused her of not being very smart because she's not verbal and she cannot move like we can. Um, so mom got really upset and immediately said, we're enrolling you at Spalding Street Elementary School. So where we're gonna pick up is she is now um, 11. So that puts her in about fifth grade, I believe. It may tell us in here as we go a little bit further. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, just a little bit of background and refresher. So chapter five. I have been at Spalding Street Elementary School for five years. It's very ordinary, filled with kids just like the schools I see on television shows. Kids who chase each other on the playground and run down the hall to get to their desks just before the bell rings. Kids who slide on icy patches in the winter and stomp in puddles in the spring. Kids who shout and push. Kids who sharpen their pencils, go to the board to do math problems, and open their books to read a poem. Kids who write their answers on notebook paper and stuff their homework into backpacks. Hmm. Kids who throw food at each other in the lunchroom when they sip, while they slip, sip on juice boxes. We would never do that, would we boys and girls? Kids who sing in the choir, learn to play the violin, and take gymnastics or ballet or swimming lessons after school. Kids who shoot baskets in the gym, their conversations fills the halls as they make plans, make jokes, make friends. Kids who, for the most part, ignore kids like me. The special needs bus, as they call it, has a cool wheelchair lift built in the door, and it picks me up every morning in front of my house. When we get to school, the drivers take their time and make sure all the belts and buckles are tight before they lower all of us with walkers or wheelchairs or crutches or helmets down on the bus lift, one by one, to the ground. Then an aide will roll, roll us or help us walk over to a waiting area. When the weather is bright and sunny, we sit outside the school. I like to watch the regular kids as they play Foursquare while they wait for the bell to ring. They look like they're having so much fun. They ask one another to play, but no one's ever asked any of us. Not that we could, anyway, but it would be nice if somebody would say hi. I guess the Foursquare players must think we're all so backwards that we don't care that we get treated like we're invisible. I was so excited when Mom first enrolled me here. I thought I'd learn new things every day, but mostly it was simply something to do that took up time and got me out of the house. In second and third grades, I probably learned more from the sci-fi or discovery channels than I ever learned at school. My teachers were nice most of the time, but they would have needed x-ray vision like Superman to see what was in my head. I'm in a special program with other children with what they call disabilities. Our ages range from 9 to 11. Our learning community, what a joke, has been together since I started at school. We never seem to move up and on like other classes. We just do what we did the year before, but with a new teacher. We don't even get a new classroom each year. So the same kids I'm with now were together in second grade with a teacher named Mrs. Tracy. As third graders, we suffered through Mrs. Billups, who could have got the award for the worst teacher in the world. There are six self-contained learning communities in our wing of the building. 
children with various conditions from preschoolers to kids who ought to be in high school by now. Our classroom, room H5, might be nice for babies. But give me a break. It's painted yellow and pink. One wall is covered with a sun with a happy face, a huge rainbow, and dozens of flowers, also with smiley faces. The other wall is painted with happy bunnies, kittens, and puppies. Bluebirds fly all over a sky with perfect white clouds. Even the birds are smiling. I'm almost 11 years old, and if I have to look at puppies in paradise one more day, I think I'll puke. Ashley, the youngest in our group, actually does puke quite a bit. She's nine, but she could pass for three. She has the smallest wheelchair I've ever seen. She's our fashion model. She is just plain beautiful, movie star eyes, long curly hair, and a tiny pixie nose. She looks like a doll that you see in a box on a shelf, except she's prettier. Her mother dresses her in perfectly matching outfit every day. If she has on a pink shirt, she wears pink slacks, pink socks, and two tiny pink bows in her hair. Even her little fingernails have, have been done to match. When we do what the teachers and therapists call group activities, it's hard for Ashley to participate. Her body is really stiff and it's tough for her to reach or grab or hold anything. Every Christmas, they make the kids in H5 decorate a stupid six foot styrofoam snowman. I don't know what the children in the regular classrooms get to do, but I know it's close to holiday time when whatever teacher we have that year pulls this thing out of a closet. Mrs. Hyatt, the kindergartner te kindergarten teacher, loved that messed up snowman. Just three huge balls of yellowing styrofoam stuck together with pins and pipes. Let's decorate, children, she said in her squeaky and annoying voice. We are going to place decorations with Velcro or toothpicks or glue, whatever works, on Sydney, our H5 holiday snowman. I don't know how old the snowman was at that point, but poor Sydney could not stand up straight. It leaned like a drunk who needed the wall to hold it up. Mrs. Hyatt gave us green snowflakes. Green? We were the dumb kicks. I guess we weren't supposed to care. Brown garland, stars in purple and pink. Do you like the snowman, Ashley? Miss Hyatt asked her. It's almost impossible for Ashley to communicate because her body is so tight. Her talking board has just two words on it, yes and no. She turned her head slightly to the left for no. I bet she wished she could knock that thing down. Compared to Ashley, Carl is huge. Even though he's just nine, he's got a special wheelchair that's extra wide and it takes two aids to lift him in and out of it but he's good with his hands. He can move his own chair and he can hold a pencil well enough to write his name and stab a snowman. Carl sticks pencils and rulers into the snowman's torso and pins it into his, its head. Mrs. Hyatt used to clap her hands and say in her little squeaky voice, good jobs, Carl, so very creative. Carl would just laugh. He can talk, but only in very short sentences that usually have two parts. He has very strong opinions. Snowman is dumb, he'd yell. Very, very dumb. I think he hates the snowman as much as I do. One year he pinned a diaper on the back and another on the front of the bottom third of the snowman. The teacher let them stay. Carl knows diapers. When he poops in his pants, which is almost every day, the whole room smells like the monkey house at the zoo. The aides are so patient with him though. They snap on their rubber gloves, clean him up, change his clothes. He always wears sweats and sit back in his chair. Those aides deserve medals. We're not an easy bunch. Maria, who has Down syndrome, is 10. She loves Christmas and Easter and Valentine's Day and Earth Day. It doesn't matter. If it's a holiday, Maria is ready to celebrate. She's wide around the middle, a little like our snowman but Maria talks all the time. She's fun to be around, even though she insists on calling me Melly Belly. Every year when it's time to bring out the ancient snowman, Maria jumps and cheers with real excitement. I'm pretty sure she's the only kid in our class who truly likes it. It's time for Sydney the snowman, she gasps. Can I put his hat on, please, please? Can
can I give you my red scarf? Sydney will love my red scarf. Mrs. Hyatt and every teacher after her always let Maria take charge of the green paper cut out candy canes and the purple striped stars cut from wrapping paper. Maria kisses each decoration before attaching it with Velcro to the snowman. She hugs Sydney each afternoon before she goes home and she cries when it's time to put Sydney away each year. Even though she has trouble figuring out complicated stuff, Maria understands people and how they feel. Why are you sad today, Melly Belly? She asked me one morning a couple of years ago. How could she have known that my goldfish had died the day before? I let her give me a big hug and I felt better. If Maria is our hugger, Gloria is our rocker. She rocks for hours in the corner under one of the dumb smiling flowers. The teachers are always trying to coax her out, but she wraps her arms around herself like she's cold and keeps on rocking. She's autistic, I think. She can walk perfectly well, and she talks when she has something to say. It's always worth listening to. Snowman makes me shiver, she blurted out one day when the classroom was surprisingly quiet. Then she curled up in her corner and said nothing else until it was time to go home. She's never added one decoration to our snowman, but she does uncurl and seem to relax when a teacher puts on a CD of holiday music. Willie Williams, yes, that's his real name, is 11. I'm not sure what his diagnosis is. He yodels like one of those Swiss people in the mountain climbing commercial. He makes other noises too whistles and grunts and shrieks. He's never, ever quiet and never completely still. I sometimes wonder if he makes all those noises and movements in his sleep. When Sydney the snowman comes out of whatever box they keep him in during most of the year, the teacher has to keep Willie at a distance because he'll knock the wobbly thing down. Willie's not trying to be mean, it's just that his arms and legs are in constant motion. He can't help it. Mrs. Wyatt was the first teacher to witness Sydney topple over. Why don't you add this bright pink bow to our snowman? She had squeaked to Willie that first year. All arms and movement, Willie tried, but the stupid pink bow went in one direction and poor Sydney went in the other. Three separate balls rolled across the room. Willie shrieked and whistled. I think I saw him smile as well. Now, if, Miss if Mrs. Hyatt had given Willie a baseball to glue to the snowman. It would have been placed more carefully. Willie loves baseball. Our first grade teacher, Mrs. Gross, liked to play guessing games. Willie just burbled if the questions were about butterflies or boats, but watch out if the question was about baseball. He'd screech out the right answer before the yelps and bellows took over. Who was the first baseball player to hit 60 home runs in one season, Mrs. Gross asked. Babe Ruth! Then a screech. Who broke Babe Ruth's record of 714 home runs? Hank Aaron! Whooping noises. And who is the all-time hit king? Mrs. Gross seemed to be astonished at Willie's knowledge. Pete Rose! 4256! Eek! And who holds the lifetime touchdown record? Silence. Not even a squeak. Willie doesn't bother with football. Or snowmen. Sometimes when I look at Willie, though, I get the feeling that he really wishes he could be still and silent. I watch him as he closes his eyes, frowns up his face, and concentrates. For just a few minutes, he's quiet. He takes a deep breath, like a swimmer coming up for air. When he opens his eyes, the noises start all over, and then he always looks sad. Jill uses a walker because her left foot drags a little as she walks. She's thin and pale and very quiet. When Sydney comes out for the season, Jill's eyes are almost blank. It's like the light has been clicked off. She cries a lot. Mr. Gross used to put decorations in her hand and try to make it easy for her to join the activity, but it was like helping a store mannequin. I heard an aide say she was in a car accident when she was a baby. I think that's awful. To start out okay, then lose the ability to do stuff? Freddie, who's almost 12, is the oldest in our group. He uses an electric wheelchair. He loves that thing. He tells me every chance he gets, Freddie, go zoom, Freddie, go zoom. He grins, pretends he's putting on a helmet, then he pushes the controller to its max position and takes off across the room. 
Of course, his speed control has two settings, slow and slower. But to Freddie, he's at the racetrack. He zooms his electric chair around the raggedy old snowman, tossing Velcroed stars and bells at it, asking, snowman, go zoom zoom? Well, after Willie sent it flying and Carl tried to stab it with pencils, I guess it was a fair question. Every year, Freddie adds his own touches to the snowman, NASCAR and NASA de decals like the ones on his chair. If you ask Freddie what date it is, he can't tell you. But if you want to know who won the Daytona 500, Freddie will know. And then there's me. I hate the stupid snowman. But I toss tinsel at it like they asked me to. It's easier than trying to explain. I have a large plexiglass tray that fastens to the arms of my chair. It serves as a food tray as well as a communication board. When I was younger, mom pasted dozens of words on it, but I was still limited to only a handful of common nouns, verbs, and adjectives, some names, and a bunch of smiley faces. There are also a few necessary phrases like, I need to go to the bathroom, please, and I'm hungry. But most people, even little kids, need to say more than that in a day. Duh. I've got please and thank you, yes, no, and maybe close together on the right hand side. On the left are the names of people in my family, kids in my class, and teachers. The name Sydney is not included. There's an alphabet strip at the top so I can spell out words and a row of numbers under that so I can count or say how many or talk about time. But for the majority of my life, I've had the communication tools of a little kid on my board. It's no wonder everybody thinks I'm retarded. I hate that word, by the way, retarded. I like all the kids in room H5, and I understand their situations better than anybody. But there's nobody else like me. It's like I live in a cage with no door and no key, and I have no way to tell someone how to get me out. Oh, wait, I forgot about Miss V. Chapter 6. Miss Violet Valencia lives next door to us. Violets are purple, and Valencia oranges are, well, orange. Purple oranges are just plain unusual, and so is she. She's a big woman, about six feet tall, with the biggest hands I've ever seen. They're huge. I bet she could put a full-size basketball in each of her palms and still have room left over. If Miss V is well, like a tree, then my mom is a twig next to her. I was about two years old when I first started hanging out at Miss V's house. Mom and Dad hardly left me with anybody at first, but sometimes their work schedules overlapped and they needed a third person to help out. Mom said Mrs. V was the very first visitor when I first came home from the hospital, the first person to just pick me up like any other baby. A lot of my parents' friends had been scared to even touch me, but not Miss V. Miss V wears huge flowing dresses. Must be miles of materials in those things. All in crazy color combinations. Bubblegum pink with fire engine red with peachy sherbet, sherbet with bright cinnamon and all shades of orange and purple, of course. She told me she makes the dresses herself. I guess she'd have to. I've never seen anything like them in a store in the mall or in a hospital either. Mrs. V and mom used to work together as nurses at the hospital. Mom told me the children there had been crazy about her. She wore the same bright outfits in the preemie ward, the kids cancer ward, the children's burn unit. Color brings life and hope to these children, she'd announced boldly, daring anybody to disagree. I guess nobody did. I remember sitting on Miss V's porch that very first time. Mom and Dad looked concerned, but Miss V held me tightly and bounced me on her knee. She must have a hidden microphone under those flowing clothes. She has one of those voices that can make anybody shut up, turn, and listen. Of course I'll watch Melody, she said with certainty. Well, Melody is, well, you know, really special, Dad said hesitantly. All kids are special, Miss V had replied with authority, but this one has hidden superpowers. I'd love to help her find them. We can't possibly pay you what this is worth to us, Dad began. 
Miss Fee had shrugged and said with a smile, I'll appreciate whatever you can give me. My dad looked sheepish. Well, thanks. And I'll get that ramp finished this weekend. I just need to make one more tra trip to the lumber yard. Now, that will be a big help, Miss Fee had said with a nod. Melody can be a handful, Mom had warned. Miss V lifted me into the air. I've got big hands. We want her to reach her highest potential, Dad added. Oh, gag me, Miss V said, startling him. Don't get bogged down in all those touchy-feely words and phrases you read in books on disabled kids. Melody is a child who can learn and will learn if she sticks with me. Dad look emba looked embarrassed, but then he grinned. Bring her back in 20 years. You'll have her back home by supper time. So most work days, I'd end up at Mrs. Valencia's place for a couple hours until mom or dad could get home. When I got older, I went over to Miss Fee's every afternoon after school. I don't know how much they paid her, but it couldn't have been enough. From the very beginning, Mrs. Valencia gave me no sympathy. Instead of sitting me in the special little chair my parents had bought for me, she plopped me on my back in the middle of the floor on a large, soft quilt. The first time she did that, I looked up at her like she was crazy. I cried. I screeched. She ignored me, walked away, and flipped on her CD player. Loud marching band music blared through the room. I liked it. Then she came back and put my favorite toy, a rubber monkey, a few inches from my head. I wanted that monkey. It squeaked when you touched it, but it may as well have been a million miles away. I was on my back, stuck like a turtle. I screamed louder. Mrs. V sat down on the quilt. Turn over, Melody, she said quietly. Sometimes she can make her voice really soft. I was so shocked. I stopped yelling. I couldn't turn over. Didn't she know that? Was she nuts? She wiped my nose, nose with a tissue. You can turn yourself over, Melody. I know you understand every word I say to you, and I know you can do this. Now, roll. Actually, I'd never bothered to try very hard to roll anywhere. I'd fallen off the sofa a couple times, and it hurt, so I usually just waited for Mom or Dad to move me to a comfortable position. Look at how you're lying. You're already on your side, halfway there. Use all that screaming and hollering energy you've got to take you to another position. Toss your right arm over and concentrate. So I did. I strained, I reached, I tried so hard, I farted. Mrs. V cracked up, but slowly, slowly, I felt my body rolling to the right. And then, unbelievably, plop! I was on my stomach. I was so proud of myself. I screeched. I told you so, Miss V said, victory in her voice. Now, go get that monkey. I knew better than to protest, so I reached for it. The monkey was now only two inches from my hand. I tried to scoot. My legs kept doing the opposite of what my head wanted them to do. I wiggled. I grabbed a fistful of the quilt and pulled. The monkey got closer. You're a smart little cookie, Miss V told me. I gave the quilt another tug and finally, gradually, I had the monkey in my hand. I clutched it and it squeaked as if it were glad to see me. I grinned and made it squeak again and again. After that workout, you must be hungry, she said. She fed me, uh, she fed me a vanilla milkshake first, then my vegetables and noodles. Mrs. Valencia always serves dessert first, and I always eat all my food. The healthy part and the yummy part, too. It's our secret. Mrs. V is the only person who lets me drink soda, Coke, Sprite, Tahitian treat. I love the nose-tickling burp. Mom and Dad mostly give me milk and juice. Mellow Yellow is my favorite. Mrs. V even started calling me that. At Mrs. V's house, I learned to scoot and then to crawl. I'd never win a baby crawling contest, but by the time I was three, I had learned to get across a room. She made me figure out how to flip myself over from front to back and back to front again. She was tough on me. She let me fall out of my wheelchair onto pillows so I could learn how to best catch myself. Suppose somebody forgets to fasten that seatbelt of yours, she said in that voice that sounded like she was chewing gravel. 
You better know what to do or you'll bust your head wide open. I didn't want to bust my head open, so we practiced. She'd send me back home, tell mom I had a good dinner and a good poop. I have no idea why parents think that's so important. Then wink at me. I was like her secret mission. Once I started school, however, I discovered I had a much bigger problem than just falling out of my chair. I needed words. How was I supposed to learn anything if I couldn't talk? How was I supposed to answer questions or ask questions? I knew a lot of words, but I couldn't read a book. I had a million thoughts in my head, but I couldn't share them with anybody. On top of that, people didn't really expect the kids in H5 to learn much anyway. It was driving me crazy. I couldn't have been much more than six when Mrs. V figured out what I needed. One afternoon after school, after a snack of ice cream with caramel sauce, she flipped through the cable channels and stopped at a documentary about some guy named Stephen Hawking. Now I'm interested in almost anything that has a wheelchair in it. Duh! I even like the Jerry Lewis telethon. Turns out Stephen Hawking has something called ALS and he can't talk or walk. And he's probably the smartest man in the world. And everybody knows it. That is so cool. I bet he gets really frustrated sometimes. After the show went off, I got real quiet. He's like you, sort of, isn't he? Miss V asked. I pointed to yes on my board, then pointed to no. I don't follow you, she scratched her head. I pointed to need on my board, then to read. Need, read, need, read. What, needing to read? Come on, guys. I know you can read a lots of words, Melody, Miss V said. I pointed again, more. I could feel tears coming, more, more more. Melody, if you had to choose, which would you rather be able to do? Walk or talk? Talk. I pointed to my board. I hit the word again and again. Talk. 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 I have so much to say. So Mrs. V made it her new mission to give me language. She ripped all the words off my communication board and started from scratch. She made the new words smaller so more could fit. Every single space on my talking board got filled with names and pictures of people in my life, questions I might need to ask, and a big variety of nouns and verbs and adjectives so I could actually compose something that looked like a sentence. I could ask, where is my book bag? Or say, happy birthday, mom, just by pointing with my thumb. I have magical thumbs, by the way. They work perfectly. The rest of my body is sort of like a coat with buttons done up in the wrong holes. But my thumbs came out with no flaws, no glitches. Just my thumbs, go figure. Every time Miss V would add new words, I learned them quickly, used them in sentences, and was hungry for more. I wanted to read. So she made flashcards, pink for nouns, blue for verbs, green for adjectives. Piles and piles of words I learned to read. Little words like fish and dish and swish. I like rhyming words. They're easy to remember. It's like a buy one get the rest free sale at the mall. I learned big words like caterpillar and mosquito and words that follow crazy rules like knock and gnome. I learned all the days of the week, months of the year, all the planets, oceans and continents. Every single day, I learned new words. I sucked them in and gobbled them up like they were Mrs. V's cherry cake. And then she would stretch out the cards on the floor, position me on a big pillow so I could reach them, and I'd push the cards into sentences with my fist. It was like string the beads of a necklace together to make something really cool. I liked to make her laugh, so I'd put the words in wacky order sometimes. The blue fish will run away. He does not want to be dinner. She also taught me words for all the music I heard at home. I learned to tell the difference between Beethoven and Bach, between a sonata and concerto. She picked a selection on a CD, then asked me the composer, Mozart. I point to the correct card from the choices she set in front of me. Then I would point to the color blue on my board. Huh? She asked. 
When she played a selection from Bach, I'd point to the correct composer, then once again touch the color blue on my board. I also touched purple. She looked confused. I searched around for the right words to explain what I meant. I wanted her to understand that music was colorful when I heard it. I finally realized that even Miss V couldn't figure out everything in my head. We kept going. Sometimes she'd play hip hop music, sometimes oldies. Music and the colors it produced flowed around her as easily as her clothing. Mrs. V took me outside in all kinds of weather. One day she actually let me sit outside in the rain. It was steaming hot and I was sticky and irritable. It must have been about 90 degrees outside. We were sitting on our porch watching the storm clouds gather. She told me the names of all the clouds and made up stories about them. I knew that later she'd have the names of every kind of cloud on word cards for me. Big old Nimbus up there. He's black and powerful and can blow away all other clouds out of the sky. He wants to marry Miss Cumulus Cloud, but she's too soft and pretty to be bothered with such a scary guy. So he gets mad and makes storms, she told me. Finally, old Nimbus got his way and the rain came down around me and Miss V. It rained so hard I couldn't see past the porch. The wind blew and the wet coolness of the rain washed over us. It felt so good. A small leak on Miss V's porch let a few drops of rain fall on my head. I laughed out loud. Mrs. V gave me a funny look, then hopped up. You want to feel it all? She asked. I nodded my head. Yes, yes, yes. She rolled me down the ramp, ramp Dad had built both of us getting wetter every second. She stopped when we got to the grass and we let the rain drench us, my hair, my clothes, my eyes and arms and hands wet, wet, wet. It was awesome. The rain was warm, almost like bath water. I laughed and laughed. Eventually, Mrs. V rolled me back up the ramp and into the house where she dried me off, changed my clothes and gave me a cup of chocolate milk. She dried off my chair, and by the time Dad came to pick me up, the rain had stopped, and everything was dry once more. I dreamed of chocolate clouds all night. So that is where we're going to end for this evening. So we will pick up with Chapter 7 when we return. Just keep in mind, um, this is a story about Melody, who does have some um, men health problems, but mentally she is there. And the one thing she wants to do more than anything is read. And you guys all have that potential to read. So get out there and find a book and read this summer. You can pick up a different book than what we're reading together. Or you could pick up this one in your library and get ahead of me if you want to see how this goes. So I hope to get back on in a day or two. And we will continue finishing up this book for our summer project. I hope you guys have a great night, and I look forward to seeing you guys again and reading the rest of our story together. Night, everyone. Love you guys.